So look, our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Chandima Devita-Tawila, um, who's a friend and colleague of mine from the Prince Charles Hospital. And Chandima is a, a lung transplant physician, and she's done her training at, as a fellowship at Prince Charles, but also at Toronto General Hospital, and Toronto is one of the, probably one of the world's largest lung transplant centres. Um, Chandima is currently completing a master's degree in organ transplantation at the uh, University of Liverpool in London, and has, has a number of research interests in our lung transplant. And Chandima is going to talk about this interesting issue of mycoplasma and ureoplasma species in, in our lung transplant. Thanks, Chandima. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, so I'm going to talk about mycoplasma hominis and ureoplasma species infections. I'm going to refer to them as molecules infections from here onwards because both it's quite mouthful to say it again and again. And so, so particularly in the post lung transplant patients. So molecules um, are kind of group of bacteria that does not have any uh, cell wall. Um, they usually colonize our genitourinary system, even up can be colonized up to 40%, and uh, less so upper respiratory tract infect, uh, system, like up to 4%. So this picture actually shows this Friday appearance, appearance of mycoplasma hominis um, uh, cultures. Um, so what's the issue with the post-lung transplant patient. So these organisms can cause uh, infection, particularly in the immediate post-lung transplant period. Uh, they're known to cause a syndrome called hyperammonia syndrome. So that's uh, pretty much increased ammonia level, uh, which can affect uh, your kidneys, acute kidney failure, and uh, affect CNS systems, causing delirium and confusion and seizures, um, and also um, graft dysfunction. Um, they're also known to cause wound infections, so it's particularly bronchial anastomosis site um, uh, infections and complications um, with that, and also can cause infection in your sternal wound and um, can cause um, impaired wound healing and dehiscence. Um, they can also cause mediastinitis, um, infection in the pericardium, and also infection in the pleural uh, space um, and pneumonia. So the exact source where this infection is coming from in the post-lung transplant setting is heavily debated. Um, some, um, there are some, a lot of data uh, to say whether it's coming from the donor. Obviously, these donors have um, these organisms as common cells in the upper respiratory tract during intubation and during aspiration, even it can go into those donor lungs. And also there's a theory that um, the genitourinary tract um, common cells can get into your bloodstream when there's catheterization or other invasive procedures, and then it can contaminate the donor lungs. Um, particularly the risk fact, donor risk factors for these infections, like they're young or if they have high risk behaviors, or obviously explains that more colonization or in their genitourinary tract and the upper respiratory um, tract. Um, there are some data to suggest, yes, they can be recipient derived. So it, again, the same mechanism. So you have uh, your common cells up here during intubation or aspiration, the things can get into your new lung. Um, during ca urinary catheterization, so you can, the, the infection, uh, the organisms can get into your blood and then contaminate your transplanted organs. Uh, and also there are some reports where, where they have seen in, our, in ICU, there's several patients getting infected at the same time. So there was some um, question about whether this can spread from patient to patient in a nosocomial setting. Uh, a recipient hypogamma globulinemia has been identified as a risk factor for these infections. But the most of these data, it's kind of coming from very limited number of studies and they're quite retrospective or without any molecular studies or using any specific culture media. Uh, the, these uh, organisms, this, in, these infections are difficult to diagnose due to several reasons. One is they're difficult to culture. So especially ureoplasma will, they don't, do not grow on conventional agar media. Uh, mycoplasma hominis, they are slow growing, very pinpoint, uh, subtle colonies, so, and maybe all grown by other competing bacteria, so it's difficult to identify. Um, and But you can increase the diagnostic yield of that if you use the selective mycoplasma or ureoplasma culture media, or if you do PCR testing, um, uh, where also you can get some information about antibiotic resistance. 
Uh, and the other problem is there's limited treatment options for these organisms. Um, so they, they don't have a cell wall, so they're resistant to beta-lactams and vancomycin. Uh, they're not sensitive to gentamicin or bactrim. Um, mycoplasma hominis, they have intrinsically resistance to macrolides, such as erythromycin, clarithromycin, rosithro, or acithromycin. So you can see the post -trans routine post-transplant antibiotics would, would not cover these organisms, so they can slip slip away from the antibiotic cover and cause uh, infection problems. Um, they're usually treated with tetracycline group, clindamycin or fluoroquinolones antibiotics. Um, and another issue is there's quite a lot of antibiotic resistance um, in these organisms. So rates can vary according to country to country, but um, they have seen like, for example, fluoroquinolone quinolone resistant urea plasma species up to 80, more than 80% in China, uh, close to 60% in Japan and close to 80% in Italy, quite high. Um, and then also this antibiotic resistance, is there's increasing prevalence. So one of the study from German showed compared to 1983, they compared their 2004 cohort and found that mycoplasma hominis tet tetracycline resistant gone from 2% to 14% and fluoroquinone fluor resistant from 0% to 15% and urea plasma superfluxin resistant from 5% to 26%. So they, they, we have limited options and there's the antibiotic resistant and it, it's getting worse over time. Um, so with that background, uh, I'm going to just share what's our local experience in the Prince Charles Hospital. So uh, Queensland Statewide Lung Transplant Service is operated from the Prince Charles Hospital um, and then what we have seen in our institute. Uh, before we go that, to that slide, I thought I'll just quickly um, show you what's involved with the lung transplantation. So we have donors, we predominantly have uh, brain dead or um, uh, cardiac dead donors. And uh, uh, the in, when we go for organ procurement, we usually do a bronchial wash before we uh, do any organ procurement from these donors. And then organ will be packed in a ST with ice like that, and then it'll come to our hospital for transplantation. Uh, before implantation, we'll do a tissue swaps and do some tissue cultures uh, uh, from the donor lungs. And uh, the transplantation obviously involves the recipient uh, two main uh, bronchi, get um, uh, anastomose to donor uh, bronchi and um, pulmonary, way, uh, pulmonary artery, anastomose to the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein will be anastomose to the left atrium. Um, so this specific site, these infections, we, we see these infections in this bronchial anastomosis site and also the median sternotomy um, uh, wound infections and the pericardium and the plu uh, uh, pleura and the mediastinum. Uh, so our recipients uh, usually get their routine uh, bron bronchoscopies and bronchial washings done on the day of transplant, two weeks after, three weeks after, and three to three months, six months, and at one year. Um, we do other cultures, wound swabs, pleural fluid, pericardial fluid, depending on the clinical situation. All these cultures are done on root horse blood agar culture. If there's any clinical suspicion, we will request the uh, micro. Um, the AI8 agar culture, which is mycoplasma a specific culture. Uh, we, don't not, we do not have PCR testing as routine things, but um, uh, we managed to um, contact the UQCCR um, under research basis. We, can, we, we, we are now able to request for PCR testing. Uh, usually our patients will stay in ICU about four to five days and uh, their hospital stays around two weeks after transplantation. Uh, our routine post-transplant medications, immunosuppressions include, we use induction agent, uh, RV vasiluxumab, 20 milligram, um, and triple immunosuppression, prednisolone, mycophenolate, and tacrolimus, um, that's lifelong. Uh, Post-operative antibiotics include vancomycin for 48 hours um, at least, and uh, the other antibiotics guided by the donor and recipient cultures for up to seven days. Uh, we use Bactrim as PJP prophylaxis and Valgancyclovir Val Val for CME prophylaxis. So these routine antibiotics would not cover any of these molecules. Um, so what's going back to our experience? So uh, between 2011 and 2021, we had we have done total uh, 357 lung transplants, and we had nine cases of molecule infections. Um, detected, overall detection 2.2. But interestingly, eight of these nine 
cases were detected during last five years. So the detection rate um, has grown up to 4.8%. I put it here as a detection rate because this is what we have detected, but not. I don't know whether this is the actual rate or this the actual rate is a bit higher than that. Um, so out of this, what happened to these nine patients? So a lot of uh, significant morbidity um, and also uh, two patients died um, one, within one month after their transplant. Uh, one death was directly re related to um, molecule infection. So one, he had a bronchial, complete bronchial dehiscence, as you can see in this picture. That's where the anastomosis is. Um, when you do bronchoscopy, that's how it looked like. And then it started to de disintegrate and completely um, fell apart. Um, and the death was due to that. Um, uh, and eight of these nine patients had anastomotic complications. So they had the infection around the anastomosis, which affected uh, wound healing. Uh, so when that happens, um, it can later progress to very tight uh, anastomosis stenosis. And they, they have low lung functions and they are short of breath. So they need recurrent bronchoscopies, balloon dilatation to open up this airway. Sometimes they end up with a uh, stents which can cause more problem in these patients. Um, sometimes when there's impaired healing, there can be very floppy anastomotic side called bronchomalacia, and then um, uh, again, um, reduce lung functions, short of breath. So we need to, uh, so we, there's not much treatment for this condition other than giving CPAP treatment or putting an uh, airway stent, which has more problems as well. So quite a lot of uh, morbidity uh, when, when you get this infection. Uh, five of our patients had sternal wound complications, so it's not healing. Um, you have to go back and do redo thoracotomies, and two of our patients has major two pectoralis um, uh, flap repairs done. Uh, they stayed in hospital for close to one month, um, a bit longer than um, our um, uh, average um, in hospital stay. Um, so the, when you look at these nine patients, uh, time to their first clinical manifestation was predominantly about two weeks, and two of them had hypogammaglobulinemia. Uh, on average, we had seven uh, clinical samples that had negative cultures before we actually identified mycoplasma or urea plasma. But to say we haven't really requested mycoplasma specific uh, uh, cultures, uh, but you know, after some time when we get negative culture. Um, a negative culture results, we um, uh, requested that. So the treatment is predominantly doxycycline, either monotherapy or combination with moxie, cleaned out ciprofloxacin, about two to four weeks. Um, three patients had PCR studies done, and we isolated in one of these patients, TET M gene, which is um, tetracycline resistance. Um, donor characteristics, same as previous studies, we show all of them are very young. Their mean age was 23 compared to our other group, uh, their mean age is around 40 years. Uh, high risk donors, six out of nine, uh, had illicit drug use or high risk sexual behavior of previous imprisonment. So, uh, so, so we have seen this increase in prevalence, then we thought, what's next? Um, so we thought we need to get a bit more data, you know, how uh, prevalent this is, you know, and what uh, where it is coming from, what are the complications, and how what is the best way to diagnose this infection. So we have started this collaborative study between us, um, uh, Pathology Queensland Microbiology, uh, as well as the UQCCR um, um, to do a prospective study on our lung transplant patients. Uh, pretty much we're in, enrolling all our lung transplant patients, checking their bronchial washes, checking their pre-transplant urine sample, and also checking donor uh, bronchial wash tissues. Uh, they, they, all these samples will have mycoplasma specific culture, and also the uh, specimen will be checked uh, for PCR testing. If there's any positive um, results, we'll, um, end, we'll do whole genome sequencing um, to identify where this is coming from. Um, so in summary, um, so the post-transplant molecule infections carries very high morbidity. Uh, they're very difficult to diagnose. Uh, true prevalence may be higher than what's reported. Uh, we have seen increasing prevalence, limited treatment options, increasing antibiotic resistance, and uh, going forward, we are doing low threshold to investigate and treat these infections. Thank you. Thanks, Chandima. Sorry, Chandima. Are there any quick questions for Chandim? It's time for one question. Uh, Peter. Yeah. 
the uh, yes, so what we have seen is if we see any positive culture so far that this is what we have seen, it always end up with really bad um, outcomes. So we, well, their plan is to treat them. Um, so culture results, we get them uh, pretty quickly. So within maybe a few days, four to five days kind of thing. Culture. So PCI is because it's a research study, it's kind of at this stage, it's just batched and then yes, yeah, slow, so we won't get that. Um, a donor also, if you get any donor positive cultures, what we do is we kind of feed it back to the donate life, so they will let all the others know, you know, all the other organ groups who have used this donor. Pretty bad, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Chandima. I think those are great examples of local research changing practice quite quickly. So thanks, Chandima. So I think uh so for future questions, my apologies, we'll we'll circulate the microphone as well for our online uh speak uh, guests.